Inside each of us lies an astonishing power. A power so elemental, so vital, the world depends on it, thrives on it. That power is human potential. The ability to create vibrant futures. It's a student's potential to become a leader, an inventor, a healer. The researcher's potential to cure cancer, to forge new discoveries, to create a sustainable world. It's her potential to reduce hunger, his determination to build a stronger workforce, and their power to lift the human spirit and make it soar. When we invest in people, we invest in the belief that, together, we can change lives and move communities forward. Ohio State has always championed people and their potential. Here, brilliance and compassion intertwine. Hearts and minds connect to create lasting, positive change. With courage and optimism, we confront the complexities of today and the unknowns of tomorrow. Through time and change, we continually advocate for those who improve our world. Whiteboards and computers, they don't transform students into leaders. The people who use them do. Buildings of metal and glass don't make dynamic discoveries. The people inside of them do. Paths of brick and stone don't build stronger communities. The people who travel them do. You do. We do. Human potential is the world's greatest resource. And when we work together to champion this potential, anything is possible. Together, we are champions for students, researchers, artists, visionaries, and communities. Together, we are champions for all. And together, we move forward. Hello, everyone. I'm Amy Jo Bachman, and I serve as the Director of Alumni Engagement and Annual Giving for the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences, and I want to welcome you to the webinar today. Before we begin the webinar, I'd like to share just a few housekeeping items. First of all, all microphones have been muted and videos are turned off. This session is being recorded and will be shared after today's webinar. Live closed captioning is being provided. Turn on closed captions via the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to utilize the chat feature in the same toolbar to introduce yourself to other attendees. And if you would like to submit questions to our speaker today, please use the Q&A feature below to submit those questions throughout the webinar. And now I'd like to introduce a member of the CFAES Alumni Society Board, Ellen S. Zimmerman. Hello everyone and welcome on behalf of the College of Food, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences Alumni Society Board to Planting the Fall Garden with Dr. Tim McDermott. I am Ellen S. Zimmerman and I serve on the CFAES Alumni Society Board of Directors as the Agricultural Communication, Education and Leadership Develop Department Representative and the Fellowship Committee Chair. The CFAS Alumni Society Board represents the voice of all CFAS alumni and serves as a resource for relations between the college alumni and the University Alumni Association. The Fellowship Committee works to bring engaging events such as this webinar to the larger CFAS Alumni Society. I am thrilled to introduce an outstanding OSU alumnus and the speaker of our webinar today. Dr. Timothy McDermott has been an agriculture and natural resources extension educator within the College of Food, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences for the past four years after 20 years in private practice, veterinary medicine and surgery. He assists client resident backyard growers community gardeners, 
teacher educators and urban farmers increased their production of fro fresh local produce through his, through his work in local food production systems in Franklin County. He utilizes his veterinary expertise for extension work in backyard poultry, small ruminant insect vector disease and companion animal programming to client residents, the Department of Veterinary Preventative Medicine and 4-H Student Livestock Project Education. He's a proud member of Buckeye Nation as a 96 grad of the OSU College of Veterinary Medicine. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. McDermott. Thanks, Ellen. As an alumnus and donor to CFAES, it is a pleasure to be here. So welcome everyone to the first session in this gardening series where we are going to focus on planting the fall garden. All right. So I love this topic and I'm really excited to talk about it. I plant um, all throughout the year. The fall is my favorite season of them all. And I really think that, you know, when we talk about Ohio and we talk about growing, Ohio is a four season growing environment. You can grow every single month out of the year and, and generally get a harvest of something green that you grew yourself all 12 months out of the year outdoors. And I say that because I do it all 12 months out of the year. So to do that though, what we have to do is we have to make sure that we maximize our gardening seasons. Now you can grow over winter. You need to make sure you make wise choices with your varieties. You have to do some season extension techniques and we all know we're growing in spring and summer, but fall is a great season for growing. The rain comes back, the temperatures start to moderate, the bad bugs start to leave. And with season extension, you can get a harvest into October, November, even December of things that you plant now. And I know what, what you're thinking because I'm thinking the same thing. This has been kind of a rocky growing season for a lot of us. We had extreme cold early in the spring, in fact, we had a, here in central Ohio, the last hard freeze overnights in the 20s was May 12th. And for comparison's sake, last year, that last hard freeze, believe it or not, was April 2nd. Then we had decent rain for the spring, but then we went into just some blistering heat for the summer, more than a lot of these plants really can tolerate because they, they don't mind warm, but when we get temperatures that are over 90 during the day and then they don't cool down overnight and they stay above 70, that is really challenging to plants. But stick with me because fall is a great time to plant. You can get a large harvest. You can be planting a whole host of different crops right now. So think about what you would like to grow and think about your plan because we like to make our plan ahead of time when we are doing our growing. And right now is a decision-making time for fall. Plus we have other things we gotta do, right? We have to think about how we're going to record data on how things have been growing. I record data and I use that to funnel my ideas and focus my plans for each season coming up. 2021's going to be dependent on what I did in 2020. I don't do it in any major crazy way. I use my phone. I like to take pictures of what I'm growing. I take pictures all the time in my garden. That helps me remember where all my stuff is. And then we're dealing with a lot of pests, a lot of weeds and a lot of disease right now. So we need to make sure that we have integrated pest management on our plate for tasks to do. Fall is a great time to do that. You wanna make sure you do as much of it as you can now because once we get on the other side into spring, there's gonna to be tons of stuff to do. So anything that you can do now to assist for your 2021 planting is gonna go a long way towards um, getting your plans in place. And then do we want to do a cover crop? Do we want to keep the ground covered with growing plants? That is great for soil health. And we have some choices that we're gonna talk about later in the presentation on what you can do for cover crops as well. So the way I really maximize what I do uh, in terms of growing all 12 months out of the year is I do seed starting. We're not going to go full in depth on this, but I will provide you with a link that I will put into the chat where if you want to learn more about seed starting, you can do that. The nice thing about seed starting is it allows you to grow whatever you want 
whenever you want. And, and that's important for the fall garden, right? Because I planted a whole bunch of things under the lights for, for growing this fall that are varieties that quite honestly, I can't really find if I go out into a nursery or a garden store right now, because that's not really where their major focus is, right? A lot of them are transitioning to Christmas stuff or not, and Halloween stuff right now. But when you learn seed starting, that is going to empower you to grow whatever you want, whenever you want. And like I said, I will provide you with some supportive links so that you can think about doing that. And, and then maybe I'll talk with my CFAES colleagues and we'll think about maybe doing a um, spring gardening webinar series that we talk about seed starting as well. If you're going to do it, keep in mind, you got two mission critical things that, that if you want to maximize your chances of success that you want to use. One of them is a light source a grow light. It doesn't have to be crazy. In the upper picture, you can see that all I have there is four shop lights hanging from a contraption I built out of two by fours and cup hooks. I put shop lights with daylight length bulbs in there. On the bottom picture, I have an LED grow light. The nice thing about LEDs are they have really come down in price and, and you can find LED grow lights now fairly inexpensively. Those are really important, especially if we want to grow into late fall or overwintered or start things really early in the spring or late in the winter that we want to grow next year because a lot of these seedlings, when we grow them, we need to mimic the sun. We need to mimic tremendous amounts of light. In fact, I set my timers on my grow lights for 15 hours of growing. So that is one of the critical things that you can do. The other thing I like to do is I like to use soilless mix for seed starting. You could go out in the back 40 and dig up a uh, shovel full of dirt and throw some seeds in it, but that might bring some disease into your operation. A soilless mix is essentially a sterile mix of ground coconut core and peat moss and perlite, vermiculite, maybe a little bit of fertilizer put in it. And what it does is it provides a great environment for a baby seedling to germinate, get some roots out and to thrive. If you don't have a grow light set up, that's okay because you can still plant the majority of everything that you would wanna plant right now outside. It might not even be in the ground if you have super hard packed clay like I have in my garden. My garden is river bottom clay and when the temperature hits high, it bakes into a brick. A lot of the reason I start seeds indoors right now for any number of the crops is because I just have such horrible germination. And if I can start with a transplant, then I can skip that germination step. But if you don't have a grow light set up, easy to do. You could simply get your little six packs that you came, you know, your transplants came in or a little pot and you can start seeds outdoors. I would still use the soilless mix or a very, very good sort of raised bed soil or something like that to start in that will optimize your germination and give you a much higher chance of success. And like I said, I will dump into the chat at the end some links that will get you to some um, webinars and things that were done earlier in the season and some informative articles so that you can read more about seed starting. It generally takes its own one hour class. So we have a few other things that we want to keep in mind when we are getting ready to plant for fall. One of them is picking the good site. And I put this up there because I grow in a community garden and I grow in a container garden. I don't have very much in-ground space in my yard that I can grow in because my yard is deep shade under walnuts, maples, and hackberries. Now, the nice thing about those is being that they're deciduous trees, they're going to drop their leaves. In fact, they're going to start dropping their leaves pretty soon. The uh, walnut is generally going to go first, the buckeye will be second, and the hackberry will be last. Um, the maple will hold on to theirs a little bit longer than the rest. But each time I have a little bit of extra light, that has given me a little extra growing. So you might have a space in your yard that you don't do a lot of growing in the summer because it's in deep shade. But if it's under a tree where the leaves are going to fall, you're going to find that you have just found yourself a little place that you might be able to grow, maybe in a container or in a raised bed. And then let's talk about soil health, organic matter, and fertility for a second. My gardens, both of them, the container and the community, have been in heavy production since, well, for the container garden, part of it's been growing uh, 12 months out of the year. For the community garden, I get in April 1st. That's generally the target date for the plow to come through and plow it. 
which means I've had plants growing in there for months and months and months. I have been using up my fertility. I've been using up my organic matter. And before I go to plant, especially some more heavy feeders, like I'm, I'm getting ready to start some cucumbers and some zucchini, some yellow squash, things that are gonna produce a high volume. I need to make sure that I address my soil health by addressing a little bit of some extra fertilizer going in there, maybe a little scoop of some compost out of my compost pile make sure that that soil has enough fertility and organic matter to support the extra production that I want to get since I'm going longer in the season. Then I think about my crop rotations. Like there's a space in my garden right now that I had taken onions out, so I wouldn't put another allium into that space. And the space that I harvested my, um, my cabbage and my broccoli, that's not going to get another brassica. I use crop rotation. We're going to talk a little bit more about crop rotation going down the line, but crop rotation is a great way to make sure that I am minimizing my pest weeds and disease because I don't want to plant a plant that is very similar to what I just harvested in the same spot because there might be disease already there waiting and I'm putting a baby plant in there. And then pollinators. A lot of the stuff that we grow into the fall is things that don't really need pollinated, right? You don't need pollinators for lettuce. You don't need pollinators for cabbage um, or other brassicas, but I like to grow summer vegetables deep into fall and things like green beans or cucumbers or zucchini, they need pollinators. The good news is I generally find that there's a great amount of pollinators available and they're looking to go to my plants because there are less flowers out there the deeper we go into fall. So I generally have great pollination because I am providing flowers for the pollinators and they are very, very happy to have um, some more nectar to eat getting ready for their winter. The way that I really have um, maximized my growing is to use a technique called season extension. Season extension is just like it sounds growing something a little bit deeper into a season that it might not otherwise do well. It can be season extension by providing frost protection to make sure that I have crops protected against cold. You can actually have season extension in the summer where you use shade cloth to decrease the sun intensity and the heat on cool season crops. But going into the fall, I use row cover. And row cover is an innovation that's been around for a little while out of the nursery and landscape industry. It is a spun bonded fabric that comes in lots of sizes and lots of weights. And what I mean by weight is it has a lightweight, medium weight, heavy weight, and then what's known as frost blanket, which is the thickest one. It is permeable to sunlight. It is permeable to water and permeable to oxygen. So when it rains, that trickles through and waters my plants. And it lets sunlight through and it lets air through. So it doesn't build up as much heat underneath that fabric. The different weights are important. A really lightweight one allows much more sun, but has less frost protection. A frost blanket has some serious frost protection, but lets less light through it. So a lot of times I'll use a lightweight one more as an insect barrier, and I'll use my frost blanket to overwinter vegetables, even go in double la uh, layers of it. So in the picture right there covering that raised bed, that is a sort of light to medium weight one. Underneath it is a bunch of lettuces and brassicas. It is providing some basic frost protection. Um, it's actually providing much more deer protection in that space. This was taken in Hawking County where we had lots and lots of deer and this does provide pretty good deer protection. Um, but it also gave a few extra degrees of frost protection. And even though there were cold tolerant crops underneath it, they really appreciated that tiny little bit of extra protection and that allowed them to grow a little bit faster. Not all crops do great underneath this. Um, you're not going to really be doing this with corn unless you build some really big forms. Um, and keep in mind that when you have your plants covered with any kind of cover, the pollinators can't get there. But where this is really, really helpful is if I am growing some green beans and I plant them right now and I'm getting a harvest of them and we're getting close to that mid-October date where we normally would see our first frost, if I'm looking at the weather and I see that we have a cold night, I can grab my frost blanket, I can throw it over my plants, that is going to protect them from frost. I do recommend, and you'll notice in this picture that this is stretched over some PVC pipe, I like to keep my 
row covers off of directly touching my plant leaves because where they directly touch, especially if it gets wet, is going to have a thermal transfer. So here's a use for it. Um, and this is in actually early, early spring. In fact, you can see there's nothing else planted in the ground down there. These were transplants that I started under the lights. We got some uh, red and green oak leaf in there. We got some prize head in there and some radicchio. And I put them down there. We had some seriously cold nights. These are cold tolerant, but they appreciated the frost protection. You'll notice I only used a medium weight just to give them a little extra protection from the frost and also from deer. They would love to come and graze on a fresh salad when nothing else is growing. So periodically I'll jump up into the Q&A and I will take a look at questions. So feel free to dump any questions that you have about growing up into the Q&A and we'll take a look at them. So Mario wrote, do you suggest starting alliums in the fall or spring? So Mario, I start them in both times, quite honestly. It really depends on the allium. Um, I love onions. In fact, when I go and teach at schools to school children, and I, I always ask them, what's your favorite vegetable? And then they ask me, what's mine? And I say, onions are my favorite vegetable. And they all say, oh, that's gross, but I love my onions. So in the spring, I'm starting spring onions, green onions, and, and your regular sort of bulb onions. In the fall, that's a garlic plant in time. I would start chives in the fall, right? That's a perennial and, and they're gonna grow and they're cold tolerant. I wouldn't start say garlic in the spring, that's not its time. I wouldn't start your regular sort of globe onions in the fall because they need that daylight length time in order to mature. So different alliums for different times. Colleen writes, what do you use in your containers? I have giant containers in my container garden because vegetables and fruit need lots of soil. What I use in mine, because that can get pretty expensive feeling, uh, filling up a, um, a bunch of containers, I use about two thirds compost from my compost pile. And then I use the rest of the um, container size as like a bagged compost or bagged humus or something like that. If I was filling all you know, of them from scratch or I had a ton of containers that I needed to fill up, I would actually probably get a bulk order of a um, compost product delivered to my house to fill them. But um, you could use uh, potting soil. When I start seeds in my containers, I do like to top dress that top like one inch with soilless mix. So Shelly writes, how do you attach the PVC tubes to the bed wood frame? I have um, four inch deck screws that are weather um, resistant and I screw those right into the wood forms. You, you don't necessarily need to do that, but I like having a wood form and because what that does is provides a lot of rigidity, if, especially if I'm gonna overwinter, that, um, that is gonna be really resistant to wind. I don't really pooch my PVC really high over my raised beds. I've seen some that go really, really tall, but, but that's gonna catch a lot of wind. Um, so I have sleeved the PVC over deck screws that are um, screwed in pretty good and, and that uh, has worked really well for me. Kelly writes, do carrots do well in the fall? Yes, they do. In fact, I would plant carrots right now. Uh, carrots are cold tolerant. They can go pretty deep into the fall and they can go really deep if you do row cover. So carrots are a great fall crop. Renee writes, I am in Southwest Ohio. Is it too late to direct plant root crops for fall? Nope, Renee, right now is a great time. All right, please suggest your top five crops. Brenda writes, please suggest your top five crops to plant by seed now using row covers. Agrabond frost blanket. Um, so if I was going, so frost blanket I use for really heavy duty overwintered stuff, but my top five crops that I plant that I will grow deep into the fall and overwinter are going to be bok choy, spinach, kale, lettuce, and radishes. All of those are fairly cold tolerant, but I would go pretty deep in there. So Rick, is it too late to plant tomato seedlings outside? Probably, but if you have them, I'd plant them right? You already have them. I probably wouldn't start any under the lights now, um, but it really also depends on the variety, right? If you were going to plant a tomato right now, let's do some calculations. We have a frost at date of October 15th. We have about 40 days until that time period. The fastest tomato is not going to really mature 
you know, if you got pretty technical and built a big form around it, you might be able to get some protection, but, but probably too late. Mario writes, how often do you change out the soil in a container? Mario, I try to never change it out completely. I, um, if I have disease in there, I crop rotate away from it. Uh, I would only change it out like if I grew tomatoes and, and at the end of the season there was no soil left, it was only roots. Um, and uh, I would, I would, I try not to totally change out the soil if I don't have to. Okay, you guys are coming with some great questions. Wow. I have a pink tongue eggplant in a 15 gallon grow bag and it is very largely the flowers keep falling off. I water regularly and test the soil. Oh, so here's what we have had and probably this is a guess, but we had some serious, serious heat. And remember when I was talking earlier and alluding to that fact that we had that, that 95 degree temps uh, it, during the day and, and over 70 at night, that actually can cause a physiologic heat response in the plants where they will drop their blossoms. And so if you looked at my eggplant, peppers, and tomatoes right now, they're only just starting to um, set new flowers. I had some early production and then that heat wave just basically caused mass blossom drop for like three weeks and they're only starting to pick up production now. So that would be my best guess as to what happened there. What kind of wood do you use for your raised beds and what is the width of the board? Gail, those are untreated two by fours, believe it or not. Um, for some raised beds that I have here at the farm, I got cedar and I got extra thick cedar because that is resistant. Um, untreated two by fours don't last a tremendous amount of time, but they're not permanently in my garden. Um, I, I set those forms up temporarily and disassemble them and use them only really in early spring and late fall and I've gotten several years out of them. How do I maintain good soil quality in my raised bed? Colleen writes, Colleen, I am always adding organic matter. Um, if, if, if I, cause you always need to add a little bit, right? Maybe 10 or 15% every year, that's harvest loss, that's er erosive loss. I soil test every three years to make sure that I am keeping my fertility up and I, um, and I mulch and I follow crop rotation and, and do all of the sort of tools in your toolbox that the grower needs. All right, great questions, gang. Okay, so here is a use where I use frost blanket and I overwinter spinach. I do it every single year. And if you're interested in doing this, our class number three is going to be talking about what you can grow over winter and we're gonna go heavy duty in depth with that. But you gotta pick something cold tolerant and I use frost blanket. In fact, this bottom picture is double frost blanket. Here's a picture of my container garden. And this is taken early. This was probably March or April. And I have a nice little microclimate here because I got black containers on blacktop. This spinach actually was overwintered under frost blanket. I planted it last Thanksgiving. I got a bunch of lettuce in here. I got a bunch of radishes in here that need to be thinned. A dozen heads of bok choy, kale, and romaine lettuce up here. So when I mentioned all my favorite things that I like to grow, there they are. They do great in um, my containers because my container garden really shines more in the cold weather than it does in the heat, as you can imagine looking at black containers on blacktop. So we mentioned crop rotation earlier. And what crop rotation means is don't grow plants from the same family of crops in the same spot each year. You want three years ideally between spots if possible. That controls diseases, weeds, and pests because similar diseases, pests, and weeds affect similar members of the vegetable families the same way. Now, I know you might not have the space to do that. And in my community garden, I can't really do that because my community garden is a multi-acre victory garden remnant and, and it doesn't have any permanent fences or permanent raised beds. In fact, the plow mixes everybody's soil together. So I have um, my neighbor's soil and they have mine. What I do in that instance and what I recommend you do is if you can't do true crop rotation, do your best job you can, right? I take my pictures. I know where I planted my tomatoes, meaning they're going to go to a different part of the garden the next year. Plus I use all the other tools in my toolbox. I try to make sure I have some biodiversity in my garden. I pick multiple different varieties of tomatoes. I pick some with disease resistance. I mulch heavily. I maintain a great even water. I add organic matter. I soil test and I provide them with fertility. I try to get a higher level um, of performance without being able to do every last tool in my toolbox, but, but that's farming for you, right? You do the best that you can. 
And here are the vegetable families. And this is important because if you'll notice, a lot of these families have a wide variety of different crops in them that a lot of people grow, right? So when you crop rotate away from Solanaceae, that means you're growing your tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, potatoes, that's tomatillos, that's ground cherries in a different spot with a three year break. Now, I try to do my best crop rotation that I can. There are certain families that I really prioritize in my garden to crop rotate. There's certain families that I don't prioritize as much because I don't see as much pest weeds and disease pressure on them. If I had to pick my big three vegetable families that I would highly recommend that you do your crop rotations in the best you can, Solanaceae, right? The nightshade family, tomatoes, peppers, and such. The brassicas, that's your cabbage family. And then the cucurbits your zucchini, pumpkin, squash, cukes, things like that. Those are the big three. Those are the ones that really get hammered the most in my garden by um, insects and by disease. So I really try to prioritize my crop rotation for those vegetable families. So make sure you're addressing fertility. If you have been planting and harvesting and you have an open spot in your garden, I just took some uh, green bean plot out that was going to um, go into probably brassicas, right? Green beans are nitrogen fixers. They've been putting a little extra fertility in there. I'll still do a light amount of fertilizer, but in the spot where I took out my cabbages, right? Big, huge head cabbages with huge leaves that grew there for a while. That was a lot of nutrition taken out of that space in the garden. So make sure you address your fertility. If you're putting in a transplant or, or, or a new seed bed, you can mix in a slow release granular. Um, if you need to do just feeding for a little while, like maybe you put in some lettuce or, or something, um, a water soluble, this one is going to feed for probably hmm, two to three months is what the label says. That's rainfall dependent. A water soluble is labeled for every one to two weeks, which is also rainfall dependent. You get a three inch rain and um, you are losing fertility into the subsoil and you'll lose water soluble pretty quick. So I like to plan when I am making my planting plan, meaning that right now is the time to plant. And for some crops, we'll talk about that. So I'm looking ahead at the weather because I want to know kind of what we have coming our way. And the NOAA Weather Radar National Weather Service likes to put out predictive models for one week, one month, and three months. And this is the most recent one. This was put out July 16th and the prediction for above or below average chances for temperature and precipitation. And this is through the bulk of that fall planting. What they're saying is for Ohio, we have a higher than normal chance of being warmer than normal. And what they're saying for precipitation is we have an equal chance for average weather in Ohio, whatever the heck that means. I'm not sure Ohio is average in any kind of weather, but I use this, this is great information. This is telling me we probably have a warmer fall. So I'm going a little bit harder planning for green beans and cucumbers and, and, and broccoli and cauliflower and things like that. Uh, my zucchinis, lots of things that, uh, that are gonna need to get a little bit of extra warmth. That is still gonna let my brassicas mature in the cool weather, um, but that's really gonna assist my beans and my cucurbits. So what to start right now if your seed starting indoors, I'm starting my lettuce indoors. I don't want to start it outside. Looking at our weather, we, we do have some heat waves coming still. We got mid 80s and above. Um, I got germination problems in my garden I mentioned to you. Plus lettuce, I, I like to grow that in the cooler weather so I can grow it for the next month indoors, get some really nice looking stocky transplants that I will put outside. And then I started some cabbage inside, cabbage family. I started cauliflower, I started broccoli rob, and I started bok choy inside. Those are gonna be transplants that I will let mature indoors so that they can avoid the heat for their baby step growing, but then they'll mature in the cool weather when I transplant them outside. And then I started the cucurbits inside. I started cucumbers, uh, yellow squash, and zucchini inside. Now I'm doing those as transplants, but I'm doing those as fast transplants. And the only reason I'm even starting them indoors is to get that germination. You can plant those outside. None of these would have a big, big problem outside in, in, in terms of germination, unless your clay soil looks like my clay soil. So right here is a nice little batch of greens. I got some cauliflower, some broccoli, a bunch of different lettuces, some romaine. These are all growing under lights. 
These will all go out later. I'm gonna do multiple rounds of lettuce. I'll probably do at least two rounds of bok choy as well. When you're planting outside, keep in mind this, there's air temperatures, but then there's soil temperatures and plants and seeds live in both, right? They're affected by the air temperatures, but when they're, when they're getting ready to germinate or their roots are affected by soil temperatures. So the nice thing is, is CFAES has a weather station network at all of the research farms all around the state. And this is the Columbus station. This is right, um, basically I'm on the grounds right now speaking to you from Waterman Agriculture and Natural Resources Laboratory, Waterman Farm. This is where this reading was taken. Uh, and it shows that our soils between about 70 to 72 degrees in that top germination point, that's fine for a lot of the warm season crops, but a lot of the cool season crops that would actually decrease their germination percentage. In fact, spinach is a finicky germinator on its best day and it would probably germinate poorly with that. So what can you plant outside right now? Um, outside right now, you could do your cabbage family. We have talked about carrots, we talked about green onions. Beets actually like to mature in the cold, but they have a wide tolerance for different germination temperatures. Uh, Swiss chard is one of my favorite greens to grow. Beets cousin, Swiss chard, that is one that you could grow outside now because you can do a little season extension, plus it has some cold tolerance. And then, like I said, I've already started this past weekend, my cucurbits, and I will put green beans in um, here really, really soon. And, and if you didn't want to grow or you, you might not fill your entire garden up, because I probably won't fill my entire garden up with fall plantings, we'll talk about cover crops here in a minute. Okay, that's a good page break to jump up into QA. How are we doing on time? We're doing good. Okay, so Renee writes, all my regular tomatoes had blossom end rot. That is a bummer. Blossom end rot is a deficiency of calcium in the fruit. Now, that calcium can be deficient because there's not enough calcium in the soil. So Renee, I highly recommend that you get a soil test done to make sure that you have enough soil calcium present. And then if you do make sure that um, you provide a nice little mulch layer because the sort of the other reason that you'll have blossom end rot is calcium is not mobile in the fruit and so, or in the plant whatsoever. Meaning that if a plant has a deficiency, whether it's because it's in the soil or there was sort of a watering problem, meaning that we had some challenging um, season on watering right now, we've had periods of rain and we've had periods of extreme dry. The higher your peaks and valleys are in terms of your soil moisture can predispose to blossom end rot. If you get a tremendous amount of rain or it dries out, you're just not, the calcium's not going into the fruit or it's going below and past the fruit. Um, so soil test to make sure that you have enough calcium in there. And then I like to do a heavy mulch cover. Um, I like to plant my tomatoes deep so that they grow a really nice root ball to make sure that they can hunt for adequate moisture and adequate calcium because moisture and nutrients are taken up by the roots. And then take a look at your varieties because um, there are certain varieties that are predisposed to blossom end rot, most notably uh, Roma tomatoes. They are notorious for that. So Renee also writes, what can be added to the compost pile for brown matter if you are unable to add grass due to weeds and have no leaves to add? Um, well, my goodness, I guess you could add straw or hay. Um, you could do maybe like a shredded newspaper if you use just sort of the newspaper that was um, not like the inserts and things. When I shred my personal information, um, you know, like old bills or things like that, I put it into uh, my compost pile because I only have leaves as my browns uh, and then I use kitchen scrap for my nitrogen. Uh, the other thing you might want to do is, is see if you can find somebody who might be able to um, get some leaves to you. When I build my compost pile, and it's almost empty right now because I've been using it the entire time, I will start, I will basically reserve like a five gallon bucket of compost and then I will get my leaves from my maple tree and I will pile it up really, really high, sprinkling some compost in there. And then when I add my nitrogens, I basically will just dig a hole in the middle of it and dump the nitrogen in there so the critters don't get to it. Uh, so maybe if you could just, you might not have leaves in your yard, but you might be able to find some from, from a friend or fellow gardener. So Melissa writes, when you cover your container garden, do you line them up in a row to cover or cover each round individually? Um, 
It depends where I have them placed. Right now, they are lined up in a row on the side of my house because that's where the best sun is, but they will kind of go into a bunch when I go deeper into fall. And in that case, basically, I, I just get row cover that's wide enough that it will go over all of them. Um, when I do my spinach overwintered, I only cover the spinach one because I won't have my entire container garden planted over winter. I did one container of spinach last year and it was so successful, I'm gonna do two this year. Do you advocate solarizing your soil in the winter? And if so, do you recommend using black plastic? Um, Gail, I've never done that. What I do is um, I advocate that you would plant a cover crop over the winter. And so what you are doing is that will, um, that will assist, depending on your cover crop, that can assist with insects and disease. And that also can assist with uh, weed control. And that is gonna build soil health by adding organic matter. And so all of those things will build up soil health so I would advocate for um, cover cropping. For crop rotation, how far away from the current site to the next site um, does it count to rotate away? I try to go as far as I can, Maureen, I'll be honest. I don't know of any data that would kind of um, really show that. And I guess a lot of it would be dependent on rainfall because um, you know, a lot of these diseases like water molds and various things that can go in there can move with water and, and a lot of, say, the fungal diseases that we have in tomatoes or things like that are blown around with spores um, um, traveling in decent lengths. So I guess there's no right or wrong answer other than I would try to go as far away as you can. I guess in the ideal world, you'd have three raised beds that were separate um, from each other and you could just move um, one, two, three in your three-year rotation. Is it best to put raised beds on landscape fabric or best to have it be able to interact more with soil underneath? I just think that if the soil is even halfway good, um, that I would put it with the soil underneath because that's gonna allow better drainage. You're going to improve that subsoil over time and that is going to give your plant roots a little bit of extra um, area to expand into. Mario says, do you worry about squash vine borers in the fall? I've seen a few in my garden this week. Um, Generally, I don't worry about them in the fall, uh, and I haven't seen a squash vine borer for, um, for a couple few weeks. They should be leaving soon, Mario, because they are sort of a June, July. Now, we did have some delay in some of the emergence of some of the pests because we had that cold, so hopefully they will leave soon. My huge problems that I'm going to have with my cucurbits are going to be the fact that in my garden right now, I got lots and lots of squash bugs and I got tons and tons of cucumber beetles. But I'm gonna show you a slide here in a second that, that shows what a plant looks like because we're gonna jump into cucurbit pests uh, in just a minute. How do I sterilize garden containers for use in seed starting? So what I do is I scrub all the organic matter off of them and then I will dip them in a dilute bleach solution like a 5% bleach solution um, in between each year. And Melissa writes, do you harden off your fall planted seedlings before planting? Yes, I do. Um, I harden them off because I want to um, make sure that I get the, um, the plants adapted and that's um, either way. So can we get the web for Waterman's Columbus Station? Heck yeah, you can. I will get you the website. Don't let me forget, Brenda. I will get it at the end if, um, for uh, the entire thing in case because we have some folks that might be um, attending from outside of Franklin County. Will you let us know where to buy seed for cover crops? So Joanne, I guess it depends where you are. If you are in central Ohio, there is a local company who is a great friend of extension called Walnut Creek Seeds. They're in Fairfield County. Um, other than that, any of the companies online now sell them Johnny Seed, Burpee sells them. Uh, you can get them bulk from Amazon, things like that. Joanne writes, would you plant leeks now? Hmm, that's a good question, Joanne. I guess you could, but I don't think you're going to get that big, beautiful leek size. So you could plant them now. They're really cold tolerant um, and you're going to have some baby leeks. Shelly writes, how does one do a soil test? Shelly, contact your extension, um, uh, wherever your county extension is. So for any Ohio attendees that might not be here in Franklin County, uh, OSU Extension has an office in all 88 counties. So the way you find it is you put your county name .osu.edu. So that's for me, franklin.osu.edu. You know, if you're in Cuyahoga, it's cuyahoga.osu.edu. We sell soil tests out of our office. Um, right now, because of COVID-19, we are appointment only from Monday through Thursday. So you would call back after this um, 
to my office if you want to come in and purchase one. Uh, we have them for sale and my admin who is outstanding can help you with that. Gail writes, do ground eggshells help as an additive for soil calcium? They do. Gail, I add mine to my compost pile first, then I put my compost in. Ellie writes, where do you recommend uh, affordable soil testing for the home gardener? Just to piggyback on the other question, our tests are like 12 bucks for sale in the office. That's the 12 bucks, best 12 bucks you'll ever spend. Generally, most soil tests should be able to be found um, around there. Jack wants the website for the weather data. Jack and Brenda both remind me. Do you recommend Comtil compost for the garden? I've used Comtil. I know some people have problems with it. You can go online for the city of Columbus and you can get the nutrient breakdown on that. So read uh, all about it so that you can make your best um, decision that way. Melinda writes, I planted carrots, radishes, and parsnips and raised beds with a topsoil compost mix. We got a few radishes, but the carrots were tiny and the parsnips ignored me. Any suggestions for approving our yield? I guess I would say, um, Melinda, I would address uh, soil fertility because um, if we're not getting the production in terms of size uh, out of our vegetables and the amount of harvest we want, we probably don't have enough fertility to support them. Almost all vegetables like their fertilizer. And Colleen writes, right now we're battling squirrels. Uh, squirrels are one of a nuisance wildlife is the bane of my existence. We have deer, groundhog, squirrels. We got birds, chipmunks, you name it. For squirrels, I like bird netting. I throw bird netting uh, on top and prop that up over my um, plants. And that has that is effective against every one of the nuisance wildlife, except for groundhogs, which will blow right through that and they won't care. All right, great questions, ma'am. FAES is bringing it. So this is one of the things that I noticed earlier this year was we had a mass emergence of cucumber beetles that came early in the season. They, they weren't there. Then we had that five inch rain here in central Ohio. Then it went 95 for four days. And then that Friday, there were clouds of them. I've never seen anything like that. I contacted an FAS colleague in entomology and he thought it might be just a mass emergence. They were delayed because of the cold. And then they all broke dormancy at the same time. They devastated the plantings in, in, in my community garden. This gardener had put this potted um, cucurbit out. It was beautiful and healthy. She left it out overnight because she didn't get a chance to plant before it got dark. She came back and they had skeletonized it. We have tons and tons of pests that are chowing down on our, on our plants right now. Here's one of the nice things about planting for the fall. When we look at the life cycle of a lot of these predators, cucumber beetles, flea beetles, for example, their normal life cycle is as we progress into the fall, they are going to be moving towards their overwintered homes. They're going to find places that they can hide under organic matter. And so as we move into the fall, when their life cycle moves them away from the garden, you'll find that you have less sort of predation in terms of certain pests on there. So this was, um, this is a yellow squash plant that I started uh, the first week of August right now. And then you can see in October 11th, that is a big, beautiful plant. And this is what a plant looks like that's not crawling with cucumber beetles. So planting for the fall actually can take advantage of some of the pests life cycles to get a harvest where right now we're battling cucumber beetles and squash bugs and secondary bacterial wilt and all of that stuff. So I talked briefly about cover crops and quite honestly, this is another one and a half hour class because there's hundreds of them. What a cover crop is, is a tool in your toolbox, a great one. It is a crop, it's usually related to some agronomic crop, but it's planted to address a problem. And people ask me all the time, Tim, what cover crops do I plant? And I say, what are you trying to fix or adjust or maintain or do in your garden? Do you have weeds? There are cover crops that are good weed suppressors. Do you have hard pan soil? There are cover crops that will, um, that will drill down there in subsoil and break up that hard pan. There are cover crops that attract pollinators. Most cover crops do a couple few things. Not one cover crop does everything, which is why you see lots of blends out there. I love cover crops. I use a few, because like I said, there's probably well over a hundred, but I, I, I have my three, four, five favorites. Um, I, I try to do a cover crop on parts of my garden, if not my whole garden, because I really don't want to leave bare soil over the winter where it's just going to lose fertility and lose organic matter and have erosive loss. So I'm going to go over two different cover crop mixes. 
this is the harder to manage one. And this is a winter mix of very cold tolerant crops. It has a forage radish in it, uh, vetch and crimson, those are two legumes, and then winter rye. All of them are very cold tolerant. And what they do is they bring all of their sort of little host of things they do. Forage radish is a great subsoiler. Vetch and crimson clover add a little bit of biomass, but they also fix nitrogen. Winter rye is a cereal grain, but it's in the grass family. It puts out tons and tons of fine roots and it holds on to soil and it holds on to phosphorus and potassium. And all of them growing together build biomass. It's harder to manage because what happens in the spring, it'll grow just a little bit in the fall and it just, it'll come through the winter, doesn't matter how cold it is. And then in the spring, once we start getting rain, a little heat and a little bit of sun, this can take off like a rocket. And if you let it get away from you, it'll be four or five feet tall and you need a metal weed whacker with a metal bladed gas powered weed whacker to get through it. Ask me how I know that. You can't really terminate this before it gets about two feet tall because you need the annuals to actually go from vegetative to reproductive, meaning they go, they start setting their seeds before you can kill them. Um, and, but, but the nice thing is, is this adds a, a tremendous amount of benefits into your garden, um, but make sure you have the ability to manage it because this can grow and get away from you. Planting for this can be anywhere from September to October. I've planted these cold tolerant crops. Uh, cereal or winter rye will germinate in 38 degree soil temperatures. So you can plant this fairly late too if you want to wait till you finish you know, your winter squash or all your tomatoes and peppers. An easier mix is a mix of oats and Austrian winter peas. That's a grass with a legume. It's easier to manage because these are cold tolerant but not cold hardy. So what happens is you get some growth on this and then when we go deep into the winter we get you know several days of 20s um, around 20 degrees which we generally do get in Ohio. Uh, this naturally winter kills so it's really easy to incorporate in the spring. You still have that sort of residue that is protecting the soil from erosive loss. You've added a bunch of organic matter um, and so this is a mix, and both of these are, are sold in blends very commonly all over the place, including all the places I listed for you. Um, the, the difference with this one is, if you really want to get your bang for your buck in terms of your production, this needs to be planted more in August or early September, and you might have a lot of stuff still in production and not want to plant this. So you got trade-offs between the two. The easier to manage one needs to be planted earlier, right, because it's not frost protected, whereas the one that's harder to manage is harder to manage because it's, it's tough stuff. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation and I want to thank you so much for attending. I'm looking at my clock and we have just a couple minutes for some questions, so I'm going to go and try to adjust the uh, Q&A ones that we have as fast as I can. Melissa writes, do you specifically avoid the walnut leaves for compost? I don't put compost in our walnuts in, but believe it or not, my compost pile is underneath my walnut tree on a poured pad. And so some residue falls in there. I've never had a problem with that. Um, although I would not make a you know determined effort to put walnut residue because of the jug loan toxin into my compost. So Mario writes, where do you buy Comtil? Uh, that is sold by the city of Columbus. Brenda, um, thanks. Put the Walnut Creek seeds in there. Um, they are great. Uh, Dave and Ann Brandt are friends of mine and they're friends of Extension and they hold educational programs and they support lots of community gardens. Um, and the nice thing is, is you, you can avoid shipping if you can go down there and pick um, your stuff up because uh, bags of seed are heavy. The, um, if you can't or if you're not living around this thing, online is fine. Um, you can find that uh, and, and I'm a big fan of cover crops. What are the things to beware of with cover crops? Like one year they didn't winter kill and it was difficult to get rid of. Joanne, that is the thing to beware of. Quite honestly, I've, um, I've had people call because their winter rye, it was just so wet and muddy that they couldn't get in there. And all of a sudden they have five foot tall rye with stems as big around as your finger, tough stuff. How would you turn under the first cover crop you mentioned? So what I would do is once it gets to the um, spot where I know it is going to um, be uh, dead when I mow it, which is at what's known as the boot stage where the seed head is coming up in the stem, then I would mow it down. I let it decompose for a little bit and then I would rototill it into the soil. 
if I was making a seed bed, um, although there's some really good um, research and some, and some things that I've seen where people will leave that winter rye residue on top of the soil and plant transplants right through it, and, and that can be a mulch. And I've done that with tomatoes. You just have to wait later in the season to make sure that you get um, some soil uh, warm up. All right, Colleen, I am going to, um, how do you manage cover crop in the spring? Actually, I have a website that I will um, provide the links to Amy Jo so that she can send those out because we are running out of time and I wanna make sure that we give Ellen and Amy Jo um, a chance to uh, thank you guys and provide some links on here. So for our last question, Macy, have you used root bags over the winter? Um, Root bags, I would say I'm unfamiliar with. If you mean um, grow bags, yes, I do. I use them over the winter and they work great. And so what we will do is um, I'm going to stop my uh, the chat and I will uh, make sure that we include the links for the CFAES weather stations as well as the seed starting links and how to terminate cover crops links in our follow-up email to everybody here. Thank you. Okay, as we wrap up the first session of the CFAS Alumni Society Board Gardening Series, I'd like to thank Dr. McDermott for speaking today and sharing his gardening knowledge. I think I speak for all participants today that we've learned a lot from your expertise. So thank you very much. Once this webinar concludes, you will be asked to take a survey. Please provide feedback about your experience today so that we can improve future webinars. Registration is open now for the next two webinars in our series, which will be on Thursdays from 12 to 1 uh, p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on September 10th and October 8th. Thank you, Dr. McDermott, and thank you again for joining us today.